Okay, Mila Falcha, welcome to Irish Granny Tarot. It's our Saturday book, and this is book number two of Journey of Souls by Dr. Michael Newton, written in 1994 and still pertinent. And we are on chapter five. If you haven't seen the first four chapters, go to video one. This is orientation. So after we're greeted by our spirit guides, we have a time of healing. And we are oriented to the spiritual environment by guides. And this is a non-physical universe, but we tend to describe it in physical terms. And I think I, I talked about that. I think uh, a lot of what people claim to see as three-dimensional buildings and such are really um, something we can relate to, but not necessarily what's really there. This is a healing place, kind of like a spiritual hospital. So case number 11 is a mature soul describing what happens. I don't know if it's a he or a she, because of course I didn't write it down. It says, I, I go to a place of pure energy for healing. I'm bathed in healing. It's like steam, liquid, light. I absorb it and I'm cleansed. I am alone, but the energy is directed. My essence is cleansed after earth. Uh, because life leaves marks on the soul and this heals it some lives leave imprints that carry into the next life and you keep you can keep your memories of it you keep the karma certainly so this process makes me whole again and when i was younger a younger soul it was less effective and after you died you have to and you've had this steam bath you go to a quiet place to talk with your guides so this is a rehabilitation of souls. There's counseling sessions, basically, with guides to look at your life and to readjust to the spirit world and decide what you're going to do next. The guide is gentle but probing, firm but concerned, and nothing can be hidden from the guide. Souls report a wide variety of environments and state of mind and intensity. All depends. Case 12, this person says, I am in my childhood bedroom. My grandmother is here too, full of love, and I realize it's really my guide, it's his grandmother. Amephis is the name. I tell of my life, and we laugh and we cry, and we discuss what I did and didn't do, and it's all okay. I must rest. My real home is here. A more advanced soul doesn't need a lot of orientation, but all, everyone is held accountable. Not judged, but your life is revealed to you and it becomes quite obvious quite quickly. Younger souls get special counseling and uh, mature souls go to master teachers. Chapter, thir uh, chapter case 13, Hester, who's 32, is uh, a strong person physically and is agitated at death that life as a real estate broker was too materialistic and unfulfilling and admits that she lacks feminine sexuality but was easily manipulated oh, but was able to easily manipulate men because she has a very male kind would be defined I guess well this is 1994 as male aggression that makes her feel incomplete as a woman so we're looking at uh, gender politics from the 90s uh, she said as a child she played more gendered type things as a child and was married because her husband accepted her being kind of a dominant character and also she complained of right-sided headaches above her ear the doctor had said now this is this is what she's telling um the doctor so she's not dead yet she has i mean she hasn't uh regressed to her death yet she's telling the doctor i got this right right-sided headaches above my ear and the doctors had told her it was stress and she's this very strong aggressive person uh, not accepting the traditional female role so she's revealing all this talking to dr uh newton f before her regression her regression revealed that she had uh, a long series of male lives and her last life um, her name was Ross Felden who was a prosecutor in Oklahoma in the 1880s who killed himself at the age of 33 in a hotel by shooting himself on the right side of his head in a trance he revealed that after his death and healing um, 
the healing steam bath, <laughs> she, uh, he, she went to an advisor to give an account of himself. And he says, oh, I know I'm in trouble for killing myself. And uh, he's told, no, no, it was just a decision you made. It's just disappointing that you bailed out too early and didn't really have the courage to face your difficulties because you're still going to have to face them. That's the worst news. <laughs> so he says, now I'll have to come back and deal with the same issues. He says, I've wasted a lot of time, you know, and I have to reincarnate and do it over. And he goes, oh, I feel sadness about that. Author notes are people who leave chronic, who have Oh, okay. So he's talking about people who choose suicide. And he said, people who leave a situation of chronic pain or total incapacity, uh, they don't face judgment or remorse. They get uh, understanding at death. So when he died he found himself at a, at the buckhorn which is a cattleman's bar in oklahoma and his guide was waiting at a table and he told him well you know the environment was to put you at ease <laughs> he dreaded facing the guide because you know what he had done um they'd set goals which he now remembered because he was dead and he had expectations and hadn't met them as ross he said i met my uh I didn't meet my contract, my life contract. I can't keep anything from my guide. I'll have to go back. Earth is so much trouble. <laughs> His guide wasn't upset. I was more upset, he says. These scenes of review and orientation counseling help the author as a therapist because it exposes the feelings of the people and the beliefs related to their behavior. And he uses the dialogue about this with his uh, guide, the, the, guy, the patient's dialogue with his guide, to bring the problems that this woman is facing into focus. And uh, he, the author feels like his own guides help him. I think that's so interesting because he started out such a skeptic. Sometimes the subject's guides will speak directly to him in the regression. Now that's something. That's, that happened with Dolores Cannon. He gets the subject to speak both sides of a dialogue. So the subject says, I fell short of a goal. The guide says, what would you change? The subject says, to not be corrupted by power and money. The subject, oh, the guide says, so why did you let them distract you? I wanted community respect, I wanted to feel important, and I wanted to be admired for my strength. And the guide says, especially by women, <laughs> I saw you dominate uh, your conquests without emotional attachments. The guide says, bring your self-awareness to bear next time. And the subject says, if I didn't ex exert power, they would control me. And the guide laughs and uh, and says, uh, you know, that's kind of unworthy of you. <laughs> what you became is not how you started. And we choose your parents, we chose your parents carefully. And the subject to the guy says, but what my parents taught me um, was to help the little guy. And it didn't work for me. I was poor and my clients couldn't pay me and I hated living on the farm. I liked being around substantial rich people. I joined the establishment as a prosecutor. I wanted to reform the system and help farm people. The guide said, yeah, but you were corrupted by the system. Can you explain that? And he says, that, well, people had to pay fines they couldn't afford and I had people hanged. I was uh, a legal killer. And the guide says, why feel guilty about uh, prosecuting those who hurt others? What about their victims? And he says, well, I was turned into a murderer by a primitive system. The guide says, so you murdered yourself? And the guide goes, well, you know, <laughs> I got off track. The guide says, you are too easily were involved with those motivated by gain and notoriety. And the subject gets a little upset with the guide and says, well, why didn't you help me more? And the guide said, I should pick up, I should pick you up at every turn. And the subject says, well, I wanted some sympathy. 
And the guide says, you did not reach far enough inside yourself. I place thoughts in your mind, temperance, moderation, responsibility, your parents' love. You were stubborn. You ignored it. And he, the guy says, I know. I wasted the opportunity. I was afraid. And he's asked, what do you value most about yourself? And the subject says that I started out wanting to make a difference. And the guide says, well, you left early. And I see you missing opportunities for uh, learning because you were feared risks. You were trying to be who you weren't. I see the sadness. So the author doesn't really care who speaks to him in these sessions, if it's the guide or the subject himself in a past life. He says whatever he hears helps to break destructive powers, uh, patterns of behavior. He tells the woman that her guide has talked about her lack of a self-concept and her alienation and her sense of lost values. And in the session, it takes her to right before her rebirth and uh, she asks, so why did you, you know, why did you choose, he asks her, why did you choose this current body? And she said, well, you know, she was so intimidating as a man. She chose to be a woman so people wouldn't feel intimidated. And so she, he asks her, well, why be such an imposing woman at this particular time in history when it wasn't acceptable? Uh, she says, well, this time I'm a surprise package. <laughs> As a woman, men will be caught off guard, and I can scare them to death. I can scare the big, powerful men. I can lure them into a false sense of security because I'm a woman. <laughs> okay. And the doctor says, and catch them, scare them, catch them, and then do what? Catch them off guard and do what? She says, nail them. Save the little guy from the sharks. And the doctor says... He takes her into their this life and says, you're a woman in this life to help those you couldn't help as a man in the past. And she says, yes, but it isn't working. I'm still too strong, too macho. The energy is pouring out of me in the wrong direction. I'm misusing people. I choose to be an intimidating woman and I don't feel like a woman. I'm in power, in a power game again, pushing um, aside principles. I'm off track. I manipulate real estate deals too. He says, I'm interested in money and status again. It's a drug. It was a drug just like it was in a past life and it still uh, exerts its control. My motivation to become a woman. Those motivations were wrong. I feel more natural being a man. What a blunder. And the doctor says you wanted a woman's insight and intuition to give you a different perspective. You can have masculine energy and still be female, feminine. Most souls, 75% of souls have a gender preference. More mature souls make the conscious decision to balance that so that they experience both. The doctor's opinion, and I think th this is really interesting, um, he's talking about homosexuality here, and I want to make it really clear for the purposes of YouTube, I'm not uh, judging, criticizing, or anything. This is the discussion from 1994 by a psychologist who's talking about uh, soul gender. And he says, people who are homosexual, uh, they, they didn't choose the wrong gender in this life. It's not that they're gay because they made a mistake about what gender to be. There's much more complicated spiritual uh, issues at work. Oh, <laughs> he says, often it's a choice of more complicated uh, life decisions based on karmic growth. So the doctor asks her why she didn't remember her past lives. And she said that we make an agreement to not remember because learning from a blank slate is uh, actually better. And we need not to obsess about the past. The focus should be on the now which I think is really, it's one thing if you've had a trauma, you have a phobia or you have an illness, a pain, an unexplained situation, and past life regression can help you to cope with that. It can be a great tool. But, you know, people do it for entertainment. Oh, I wouldn't regress to see if I was Cleopatra, you know. <laughs> and really what we need to be worrying about is the here and now. 
It's better to not want to avenge past things or to dwell on past wrongs. We get flashes from our dreams and during times of crisis and your guides can nudge you. You have a little voice in the back of your brain. She came to the doctor now because she was ready for a change and she was allowed to see the past because it was a benefit. The doctor says when people keep in a state of amnesia, I can't regress them. They're just not ready. So he tries to help bring the past and the present into alignment. He suggested to her to lower her defenses, to be a woman for reasons other than intimidating men, <laughs> and to be less aggressive. Oh, and it's not a good aggression. It's an intentional, intimidating aggression. To restructure her professional goals and to volunteer. See life as a learning opportunity. After death, we have clarity. And the stupid things that we've done hit us really hard because when we go, oh God, I was so stupid. But as a soul progresses in the spirit world, understanding and acceptance, relaxation about it increase. Souls are shocked by the violence on earth and the negative emotions, the anger, the hate, the fear, and the pain. But they need to be exposed to it to grow and learn. So orientation is a process of self-evaluation. If you wanted to call that the judgment, you could, but it's not really. It prepares a soul to face a panel of superior beings called the Council of Masters. This is like a board of review. <laughs> this is like a an unbank of a, a federal court, I guess. Three to seven members, they give you feedback. Uh about your intent as much as about your action. It's more about what's going on, you know. Uh, you're not condemned for what you've done. You're not judged. You're, you know, they work out, okay, well, this is what you intended. This is what you should have been doing. You know, you've accumulated a karmic debt or you've worked off a karmic debt. Uh, conscience is uh, the soul's responsibility of the human brain. Um, it's not a moral sense of ethics. It's an awareness of what you should and should not be doing. But you get lots of chances. Next along the route is uh, the transit of souls. So we're on chapter six, transition. All souls eventually reach a staging area. They may be escorted. If they're advanced, they know to go there. Or they're drawn there magnetically. It's uh, not a place that you linger. It's a place where groups go to find their proper um, destination. It's like a transportation hub. It's, <laughs> this is so cute. He says, it's like the LA freeway without the, uh, the gridlock. So here the spirit world is clearer. It's a place of luminescence. Uh, others can look like sparks or starlight. It's a place of pure thought and harmony. Uh, thoughts can connect souls with those that they hope to meet. And case 14 best describes this. This is a 41 year old graphic designer. It actually has a very old soul. And he sees unlimited space, he sees movement, and creates a sense of being in, uh, oh my god, I can't read it, in a bowl. And he travels on a directional force lines like a grid system, vibrational springs. It's a real complicated description of this situation. But he's moving in purposeful movement as if in a current under control from elsewhere. He sees many souls as if being pulled in a river into a sea. Uh, they twirl around and they get pulled into quieter tributaries and end up, you know, going off by higher entities guiding them and uh, higher than their regular guides. It, he says it feels really peaceful. It's as if you're heading down a hallway lined with galleries full of lights and the lights are souls. There's a glow from their energy and you see the souls as uh, lots of light in groups like bunches of grapes. From afar it would look like a long glow worm with sides bulging in and out and the whole thing appears to move. They reach uh, another corridor and he's hearing friends and realizes he's going to join them. I'm going home. Older souls also feel connected to the other groups not only their particular group, but to other groups because they have more interaction. 
no one is a stranger there's no hostility you're recognized and there's a universal bond younger souls are shocked by uh, the unfairness that or that earth exhibits and it takes several lives to get used to it the, and they're fragile and need support when they die Case number 15 is a younger soul, less mature. He says, I feel like I'm floating on a chain and now I'm in uh, an area with many souls that are crisscrossing. This is like that hub. The, the guide is with her. Um, you're never alone. Sees nests of people like groups of fireflies. I guess that would be like the string of grapes, you know. Uh, feels warmth and empathy it's dreamlike and finally recognizes a group and is upset because can't she can't reach her father he telepathically tells her that they will eventually reach each other developmentally but right now they have to go their different ways she has a sense of homecoming recognizes people from past lives is remembering how it all works it's coming back to her she can't mingle with other groups because that interferes with their energy so you don't join with other souls until you're closer to the vibra vibratory level but mental contact is okay so sometimes um wander uh, wonder about loved ones like where are they and uh they may have already reincarnated there's often uh, sound vibrations. It creates a familiarity in the group. They, they all sound the same. It often describes, is described as classrooms with teachers or even schools. Once back with your group, you're summoned to the council to examine your life, and often the guide acts as an advocate. Hope he's better than Trump's lawyers. Uh, you're always treated fairly. The elders are kindly. They you can't hide anything anyway. And you'll see them again before you go to Earth, after you've decided how that's going to be. So you'll return from the council and go to the appropriate developmental level for where your soul is. And that's called placement. Chapter 7, placement. So everyone is in a designated le level. They're organized support groups. And it's dis determined by the maturity of your soul. Primary groups are small primary units of entities with frequent contact. They have a peer sensitivity. So you're all kind of on the same level. You know each other. There's not a lot of you. Secondary groups are a larger community of support group, uh, less intimate. So they'd be like your friendly neighbors. And uh, there are giant sets of primary clusters, more than a thousand souls. And they usually don't interact a lot with the other layer the secondary groups there's really no need but they know each other the inner circle can number it between 3 and 25 the average is 15 and this is determined by lessons you need to learn past life connection or identity traits might come into play different clusters uh, who interact have peripheral roles on earth so you got your primary cluster, but there may be a few clusters that interact with you. And when you guys all reincarnate, they might be that old friend from high school or your mail carrier or something like that. Uh, the same clusters are closely united for eternity, often like-minded on the same level and have common objectives and choose close lives on earth. Your parents may greet you but they may not be in your primary cluster. I think that's very interesting. Siblings and spouses and friends in contemporary groups uh, because of social learning, that's important. Parents are the kids' primary identification figures uh, for good and bad karma. It, it's a heavy role to be a parent because you're teaching children right from wrong. But other relationships have most influence on your personal growth. Other family uh, generations uh, have their own special roles with us. So your parents teach you right from wrong. And you may be close to your grandparents or your aunts or uncles, whatever. They're special, right? But the people that really are significant in your soul progress are your peers, the people that you work with, the people that you go to school with. So, case number 16. This person says, I go to spiritual classes with my friends 
it's in a Greek temple, and every time I return, we um, shimmer with light. I see a library, groups of people talking. It's sedate, it's warm. And I think it's important just to say that this is more of an impression than a reality. Probably don't die and go to a Greek temple, but you die and have that feeling. More women are in this group because that's what we feel more comfortable with now. Uh, it's got to do with valence. Gender preference has to do with valence. That's charge, electromagnetic charge. There are approximately 20 people in the study group and five are very close. All are on the same basic level, and this person says, I'm around the middle. My five friends use names that define our essence. I am Thistle because I have sharp reactions to new situations. We look at life's books, large, thick picture books, multidimensional, but they move, so it's like you open a book and the page is like a movie. And we see our past lives and alternatives that we could have done. We see the lack of self-discipline or whatever. We can see little bits of the future, possibilities in the form of lessons. Not the whole thing, because you have free will and you know. So we help each other go over our mistakes. We discuss the value of our choices. This building is our group and the others study in the other buildings. We can go to uh, a place for newer souls to help with their homework. And we can relate easily to that because it wasn't so long ago. Um, soul restrict, soul is, the soul is restricted to the area but doesn't feel confined because it can reach out mentally. But once people in a trance, once uh, the souls have more recall, so if you go into a trance and you rec your soul recalls its past. And once that happens, they report many levels mingling in recreation. Many report forming a circle to unify thought energy. It's a form of um, singing and dancing to generate energy. And this forms physical images to celebrate uh, and then celebrate past life influences that were positive. So they're kind of reliving the past. The description of the place is like a temple, but it's different for everyone. People report that the words are inadequate to describe what they see and what they experience. Souls recognize each other by color uh, because it's indicative of your vibratory level and your energetic mass. It's like Kirlian photography. Every soul is different. Souls report seeing others as light. Not all white, all sorts of colors. The deeper the color, the older the soul, the more developed. And this changes slowly as you develop. Temperature and light waves are seen on different colors in the stars. So we know that this is true. It may have to do with electromagnetic fields. Oh, who do you think? <laughs> So it's got to do with vibration, it's physics, light, motion, sound, time, they're all related by vibration and through metaphysics too. Individual wave patterns are the soul's aura. Our patterns of energy show who we are and our ability to heal others and regenerate ourselves. This is true in physics that a lower vibration is a white light, a higher vibration is a purple light. And there's a chart here. Let's see. The classification model for soul development levels, and I'll just show it to you. I'm not going to belabor the point. You can stop the video, I guess, and look at it if you want. Okay. So his subjects all describe uh, an organized structure uh, of learning and this fosters enlightenment a hierarchy of souls was uh existed in ancient beliefs for example plato called it the the um stages of moral reason early christian theory said souls have the hierarchy of degrees of being uh it has no relationship to the levels of your life circumstance so if you're a rich person it doesn't mean you're a higher level soul Souls are in development groups uh, that are closed to new members because they're developing together. Uh, grouped by similarities of ego, 
cognitive awareness how it's expressed and uh, your desires. The groups are don't intermingle with others' energy, but they can communicate. So there's a subtle difference there. Groups can form into smaller study groups, but they stay in their groups. Uh, the rates of learning vary. Those with advanced abilities can help elsewhere, but stay with their own group. They can advance to combined study groups. As they increase in development, they get more independent, but don't lose touch with their group. And spirit guides have wide leeway. Chapter 8 are guides. So every subject that he's ever worked with, the doctor says, has had guides. And people who meditate a lot may be more aware of this. This shows us the continuity of life. It shows that our identity as a soul exists. And it's all part of the fulfillment of our destiny. Uh, guides are complex entities. They have a degree of advancement. Uh, a guide depends on awareness levels of the soul. So who your guide is and whether you're a guide. Mature guides may be assigned to more than one soul. Some work with groups and they have assistants. You may have one mature guide with several student guides who are their assistants. In the trance, the subject... Um, names the guide and the guide uh, this name often relates to their past lives together sometimes it's impossible to duplicate the sound of the name it's more important to understand the purpose of the guide spirit friends are not usually guides they're friendly and they're helpers on our same basic level to give encouragement but they don't guide you we can be incarnate <coughs> companions in our physical lives as well with our spirit friends. This gives us comfort and ideas. The idea of personalized spirit, spiritual beings is um, an ancient idea. It's also associated with the protection of cities and states and patron saints. Personal soul deities are uh, like a guardian angel can be called upon in crisis. So the terminology is irrelevant. Polynesians believe their ancestors can assume that role. The Iroquois believe that your own soul is connected to a higher spirit that can resist harm and guide you. Many American indigenous cultures believe this. Uh, they, they are the makers and the holders of uh, life, life paths. We anthropomorphize uh, spiritual forces around us. This provides imagery that we can access more easily. People often feel that God is too busy and they are unworthy to associate directly with God. I don't know. I thought God was omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. All the omnis. <laughs> so, therefore, these people use intermediaries and prophets to feel more personal. Um, and I know that there are religions who really don't like that. They're like, you don't need anybody to intercede for you. But there's a psych sort of a psychological thing about it. He says he thinks guides appear to really religious people in the forms of figures of their faith. So you might think you're seeing Jesus or you might think you're seeing Buddha. And who knows, you know, maybe you are. But that's just what you can relate to. We are uh, their direct responsibility um, and the guides. We are their direct responsibility and they are with us for many lifetimes. Guides are chosen specifically with our individuality in mind. My guides deserve a purple heart. That's all I can say. So guides have compassion. Their teaching styles vary. They're teaching uh, the maturity uh, to the soul and it determines how they teach. Their gender is irrelevant. Some are androgynous. Some switch back and forth. Um, different levels of maturity of uh, teachers, guides, and masters. So uh, you can, as a soul, you can move to become a master eventually. Case 17. Uh, only practiced guides work with many souls. The number doesn't matter. Once you're an accomplished guide, it depends on the types of souls. You get, you get help when uh, needed. Master guides have a purple aura. Guides have a love of training and a desire to help. 
they're compassionate, but uh, not too easy. They're not judgmental. They don't impose their values on you. They build morale and instill confidence. So we are individuals. They let us make our own mistakes. They cannot interfere with our free will. They're loyal. They never give up on us. And most importantly, they motivate and instill courage. Some guides are still incarnate. So there might be somebody in your life who's actually one of your guides. Case 18. One lifetime, this person was an abused slave girl, and the guide was an old man and the only one who was kind to her. She said he taught me to trust myself. Uh, repeatedly, this person showed up in later lives as a friend or a brother, and this was my guide. Um, in trance, she says she realizes that this entity is now her son. I knew on the days that he was born that he was familiar. As a newborn, his eyes soothed me and kept me strong. An incarnate guide will not take a role that interferes with the work of the soul or other souls. They will not interfere with free will. Fast evolving souls and many guides are gifted. Some guides will work in pairs. The pairing can be for any number of reasons. It's a complementary relationship. They don't interfere with each other's work. They fill different needs or have different gifts to offer. Case 19 describes two guides and their personality very differently. Uh, one helps with problem solving and one helps as a consoler and a nurturer. No two guides are alike. In the past, they were called controls by mediums. They're harmonious and energy pattern with the souls that they help. He sometimes gets help from the subject's guides, the doctor does, and sometimes they block him and he doesn't really know the reason except that the person, the soul in, in trance should not know something. Guides only want the best for us and sometimes that means watching us endure pain. They can't assist until we're ready to make changes. We don't need to fear them. Some people fear the guides will abandon them. That's not going to happen. The methods guides use are not predictable. They can be in touch with us through meditation and prayer. We all have the ability to send thought waves and the guides will hear us. Our request for help will be, will be answered, although not necessarily the way you'd hope. We can focus and hear an inner voice and we might not initiate it. One out of 10 people report hearing an inner voice. And is that their guides, he asks? Often guides will intercede with other guides to bring people into our lives to help communication. And it often comes as a feeling. Some call it uh, inspiration or intuition. I get it. I, I, I see some psychics on, on, TV, on you know, YouTube will actually sort of Somebody talks to them, basically, in their head, you know. I get it as a fully formed thought. I, I'll be uh, going about my day minding my own business and boom, you know. And, and they have a significant um, sense about them that's different from just daydreaming or whatever. I do a lot of daydreaming. <laughs> I think that's often referred to as space cadet, but I'm not entirely sure. Anyway different for everybody. Some people actually hear a voice. Some people experience a thought. Some people get a gut feeling. Um, guides illuminate the pathways with clues at a controlled pace. When asking for help, it's best to not demand immediate change. <laughs> Request help step by step. Realize there are many different paths that come to solution. Guides feel a spiritual sorrow when we make poor choices. <laughs> Souls evolve to higher and higher levels, and the reality is that not very many of us on Earth are at an extremely high level, as we can see. Um, we all share in a universal divine essence and status. Chapter 9, the beginner soul. So there's two types of beginner souls, the really new ones and the ones that are immature despite having incarnated before. 
Three out of four humans are beginner souls. Now that comes as no surprise. Most of us are operating at a pretty low end and each century helps to bring a higher awareness, which, you know, makes sense, right? So the doctor has kept track of soul levels of clients and, uh, and he says th that probably the representation is kind of heavily weighted, overrepresented uh, in higher souls because they're seeking help. Uh, doing the numbers, he guesses that only about uh, a few hundred thousands are higher level souls on the entire earth. Uh, the higher the population number, he says, the higher demand for souls and the higher the number of immature souls. Many subjects tell him, I know I'm an old soul. And he says, nobody wants to be a beginner. <laughs> uh, he says, you can reincarnate for tens of thousands of years and still be a lower level soul. <laughs> And that's called a slow learner. The reverse can be true, you know, that you really mature quickly, but that's really rare. Uh, one subject in 850 years got uh, rid of bigotry, did really well in that regard, but didn't get rid of envy. <laughs> a subject in 700 years still struggling, oh, 1700 years was still struggling with wanting power, but learned compassion. Case 20 is a woman with very few past lives, and she's angry about uh, a short life she had dying at the age of five because she missed so many opportunities. She describes the actual formation as uh, an individual soul. It's almost like a soul nursery. It's raw energy that evolves into a self. Uh, signs that she's a young soul. So we can all think about this. She gets into ruts. She takes no responsibility for anything. She's not generous, no generosity of spirit. She came to him to know why life cheated me out of happiness. <laughs> and uh, she had an inability to bond with people. She'd been divorced two times and wasn't close to her children. He says, beginner souls may lead lives of confusion and ineffectiveness. They're not in harmony with the spirit world. They uh, surrender to the control of human society in a subordinate role. And I wrote, <laughs> I wrote in the margins, MAGA and fundies, fundamentalists. So uh, they lack independent thinking. They're self-centered. They don't easily accept others for who they are. But they can lead positive lives and they do advance. And you can't judge people because people grow and learn their lessons. Uh, souls develop and it's, it's a complex, complex process. We progress unevenly. It's important to recognize your faults, to avoid denial, and to have courage and self-sufficiency to make adjustments in life. As souls emerge from uh, a new status of being young to being more mature, they join a layer of groups uh, of beginner souls that are progressing, and it's they're usually happy, you know, happy to be with others and learning. Usually after about five lives, these groups uh, include past family and friends. Group dynamics impact each soul because it's peer support. So the next case he talks about is a, a grandiose male. He's raucous and narcissistic and the whole group is male oriented like this, which is why they're all together. And they use humor to express themselves but there's deception and hypocrisy behind it. He says that honest peer feedback in this group acts like a therapy. It's curative. Learning comes from the group as much as from the guides. Case 21 is a guy who was a Dutch artist in 1841 and his spirit group 
teases him about his appearance because he liked fancy clothes of the society of the time that he lived, and so that's how he likes to appear. And uh, we often tease each other as souls. We tease each other about the foolishness of uh, how seriously we take things on earth. Uh, and, and this is so interesting. He said it's important to know that it's just a big stage play. What did Shakespeare say? So he described his five closest spirit group members and they're all different personalities and involving at different rates. And they're sad that uh, one as, who is especially close has evolved so far that he's going to leave soon to an advanced group. He says, we'll catch up eventually, but you know. He describes the group members who have lives of adventure and excitement. This is the characteristic of this group. He sees the uh, failings and hypocrisies they all see the failings and hypocrisies of one another, and they talk about it. They tease about it. Souls still have deficiencies. Uh, it's a process, a work in progress. Groups, like family groups, share similarities. They trade off roles. Sometimes the supporters, sometimes the ones needing support. In the group, they get compassion. It's not a power struggle, not manipulation, no secrets. Not hostility, no shame, no guilt. They respect each other and feel safe in the group. They try to help each other learn from the mistakes and make amends. He says we can feel discouraged and unworthy. And a way groups use spiritual energy for healing is they're surrounded as a group in a cone of healing energy. And that helps with unity. There's collective insight, and the guide will pop in to help the group. He uses light touch because of individual characteristics of the souls. This works better. Um, it, it, it's working with our spirituality because we are not just actors on a stage like we pretend to be. <laughs> this group is male-oriented because Earth is uh, an action planet. That's interesting, and it? He says, we take our male role to dominate and be recognized. The subject knows that they were brought together by uh, planner entities. There's no new members because they have such closely shared past experiences. Somebody would be left out. We bring nerve. We challenge convention. Often groups are linked by similar issues blocking their advancement. <laughs> hint, hint. So they'll associate with other more uh, female-oriented groups for that energy. Advanced souls have balanced gender preferences. Earth shortcomings and moral conflicts are recognized as uh, faults way more in spirit the subtleties spirit group dynamics are not like group dynamics on earth there's no ego no clicks no stars no isolation souls do spend time in personal reflection they do learn from solitude and they're given soul tasks to work on their energy to focus it also they mentally help the earth to go to a place of protection Okay, they can uh, project their energy out to Earth and uh, use, gives it to Earth for comfort or to effect change. Hmm. Chapter 10, Intermediate Souls. These groups, these intermediate souls have reduced group activities. They're mature enough to be independent. They're able to reduce the number of incarnations um, and they're able to increase their responsibilities. They're more of a colleague with the guide. Uh, they're, they're not as much of a dependent to the guide. They develop skills to become guides. He sees this level of development in clients that have more composure, more trust in others, and less suspicion of other people. They have a forward-looking attitude of faith and confidence for the future of humanity and encourage those around them. They have the comprehension of esoteric ideas, universal life plans, purpose, creation. Um, the next case is uh, a man who's about 50 years old, quiet and solemn, unassuming, detached, small in stature. 
He worked for a charity, uh, Food for the Homeless. He was once a journalist, but uh, declining enthusiasm for his work made him switch. He was tired. He wanted to spend the rest of his life alone. He was regressed to a past life, and he showed a lone wolf pattern. When he was a woman, he didn't have children. When he was a man, he was nomadic. He was obsessed with freedom of movement, rebellious. He resisted uh, tyrannical societies. He really wanted to uplift people from a sense of fear. He once was killed promoting nonviolent relations between Aztec tribes. In the 14th century, he was a chronicler who was traveling the Silk Road, passing on information. He was frequently an outsider from society. He was an explorer for truth in many lands, many lives, and he was an old soul. So he told him that his lack of intimacy was impeding his progress. And that was the problem. Case 22 was working with two souls who were longtime companions. This guy had a guide who could filter thoughts because he didn't need to know everything. And he was trying to convince his guide to incarnate with him. And they could be a couple and get married. So, Because remember, gender is irrelevant. So at this level, um, he learned to be a guide and assumed, took on new souls that were assigned to him and closely watched them like an apprentice. So he's working with his friend and he's kind of the apprentice. So guides have different weaknesses and talents. They're, you know, just souls, just people. So we all reach spiritual wholeness, but with different avenues of learning. So... You know you're ready as a guide when you recognize you're in balance. His soul is living two parallel lives, uh, which accelerates development. I thought that was really interesting. He discussed plans with other souls before in, in incarnating. Without addressing and overcoming pain, you can never really connect with who you are and build on that. The more pain and adversity which comes to you as a child, the more opportunity to expand your potential. Souls are allowed to make mistakes and learn from them. Soul splitting, living parallel. You can do more growth, but part of us uh, never leaves the spirit world when we incarnate. Uh, it remains dormant waiting for us. It's just all hard to wrap your head around. So we originate as uh, one unit from the maker, and we're made of particles that are energized units, and they can um, split between more than one life. It's interesting to think about. Dolores Cannon talks about it. In the spirit world, they can interact in groups, they can learn to be a guide, they can incarnate, they can involve in three areas that are non-dimensional, spheres of attention, habitations for spiritual life. One is the world without ego. Now, these are the three areas. The world without ego. It's a place of learning to be for new souls, to learn who they are, it's a place of origins, you, your, your character. is. It's not a choice. It's determined by your energy. This is where you learn, learn to do the best that I can with who I am. It starts with no ego and no idea of self. And here we are offered the meaning of all our existence. Your identity doesn't require you to go to Earth. And no planet lasts forever. However, certain energy souls have an affinity for specific forms of physical life. And a new soul may be drawn to a certain place, and this decision is helped by their guides. Usually you start with an easy world. Earth is severe because it has physical and mental suffering. Well, we didn't need to be told that. So we who come to Earth are called adventurous ones. <laughs> Humans are unique, we're egocentric and vulnerable. We could be mean and have the capacity for kindness. There's always that push and pull, the weak and the courageous. 
Attraction is also of Earth is also to be able to help humans know of the infinite life beyond Earth and to help them express benevolence through passion. Humans have great passion. We can be noble. Some few souls have trouble and must go back to a world without ego and are mended with the restoration of positive energy. The second kind of world, that's the world of ego. The second kind of world is the world of all knowing. Uh, this is the opposite. It's not for young souls. It's a place to strive for a place of uh, contemplation. It's the ultimate mental world of planning and design. It's a final destination. It's all thought. Here is where the senses of all living things were coordinated. Uh, blends, it blends content with form. It's a dimension where the realization of all our hopes and dreams is possible. We get glimpses as an incentive to encourage us to finish our work and uh, join the masters. So this world can only be known by very high level non-reincarnating souls. Souls who don't need to reincarnate anymore. So I don't need to worry about that for a good long while. Then there's the third world, the world of altered time. This represents one's own physical world. Uh, this person's is Earth. It's a temporary simulated world for training purposes. We can change time sequences to study specific events to improve decision making, abilities for life. It makes you more discriminating. So it's like a practice place that copies where you're going. It's a world of non-physical spatial working area. It may involve different dimensions outside the restrictions of time. Then there's the world of creation and non-creation. It's 3D physical, but it's larger, colder, less has less water than Earth. It's actually physical. It's not near the real Earth and it's not in the Milky Way, but it is in the galaxy. So to go to this world between Earth incarnations is to create and, and enjoy yourself as a spirit. The highest life there, uh, the normal life form there, is small animals. All animals have souls with simple fragments of mind energy. Each form of life is in a family of souls. This world is like a vacation that we're talking about, this fourth kind. There's no fighting. It's pristine and it's quiet. It can You can create here without disturbing other intelligent life. He tells about going to this Earth 2 world. He says, I see what I'm supposed to create. And a teacher helps me to use small amounts of energy and guides um, and teachers help, other teachers help. He, he learns to create basic elements, gases, rocks, dust. So it's a place where you learn to manifest, I guess. We alternate our energy to create heat, pressure, cooling, <coughs> and transform whatever they're given. They can experiment and get better. They're in directing energy flow. It's like sculpting clay. Groups of souls from all over the spirit world incarnate to earth trying to learn to do, uh, he's trying to learn to do plants. The spirit world is not a pyramid. We're all threads of the same long fabric woven into it. That's like that tapestry, right? The Akashic Records. It's a process of learning. The process of learning creation is slow. We can all create. Uh, we can create a minim minimal planetary microhabitation for a set of organisms. That's where you start to learn to contribute to uh, the development of living things. And this is a very high level soul and it may have the strength or the weakness um, in this area, but not in other areas. So like, like they said earlier, you might have Learn to conquer envy, but not to conquer greed. You may have learned to manifest and create, but not to tell the truth. You know, I just so advanced soul will specialize, and the soul can totally become uh, only a feeling for a while. The subjects have told him of associating with beings that are mystical spirits of nature, and we're talking elves, giants, mermaids. 
that folklore and legends may actually be soul memory and not just stories told for entertainment. They're actually the memories of uh, previous lives. I'm going to end here because this is almost exactly an hour and it's the end of the chapter. So this is the end of video two and we'll be back with video three. And I hope you're enjoying this and thank you very much for watching. It's pretty interesting. Slangafoil.